an interesting conjunction that uh, All Souls Day, the day of the dead, the day that the Christian church honors the dead is also the commemoration day for Soan Shaku. And it's also the day after Halloween and the day before the day before the election. So a very auspicious day. And I'd like to commemorate Soan Shaku and also um, continue on in the vein of um, talking about the Eightfold Path and talking about right meditation by telling a couple of stories. The first is the story of Soan Shaku and his contribution to establishing Zen in America. And the other is a story worthy of Halloween in that it deals with a serial killer, uh, supernatural powers, prophecy, uh, a really wonderful story. So beginning with Soan Shaku, he was born in 1860 which was a very um, tumultuous time in Japan, politically speaking, and in so many ways. It came uh, very soon after Japan was opened to Western influence um, as a result of the gunboat diplomacy of the United States, Admiral Perry, uh, steaming into Nagasaki Harbor with five modern gunboats and demanding that Japan sign a treaty of commerce, of trade with the United States, which was a momentous occasion in Japan in that it opened Japan to Western influences, not just economic influences, but influences of uh, Western culture, Western intellectual tradition, um, Western fashions, Western industrialization. And so this was the moment into which Soan Shaku was born a time of great change in Japan. So Shaku was an amazing young man. He was a monk who received Dharma transmission from his teacher at the young age of 25. But showing his independent streak and his interest in following the Dharma wherever it led him. At the age of 27, he took the highly unorthodox step of moving to Ceylon and studying under a Theravadan master, living for three years in the forest tradition of the Theravadan lineage, living as a bhikkhu for three years. He returned to Japan, and at the age of 32, after his teacher passed away, he became the Roshi at Engakuji. Continuing his very unorthodox, very modern, uh, very adventurous path, 
At the age of 33, he went to the United States, the first Zen master to visit the United States, where he went to Chicago for the World Parliament of Religions, a very influential meeting of the minds of Buddhists and Christians and Muslims, Hindus. There he met a publisher who expressed an interest in having Buddhist texts published in the United States and also uh, wanted very much to have a young Japanese uh, translator to translate Japanese works into English. And so when Sonshaku returned to Japan, he spoke to his then very young lay disciple, D.T. Suzuki, and asked D.T. Suzuki if he would travel to the United States and work with this publisher. And D.T. Suzuki, of course, went on to become one of the most influential figures in transmitting not just Zen Buddhist texts and an understanding of Zen Buddhism to the United States, but of Japanese culture in general, a truly phenomenal uh, academic talent with a deep understanding of Zen whose role in laying the intellectual framework for the propagation of Zen Buddhism in the United States is incomparable. Perhaps the only person who was as influential in a similar vein was the writer Alan Watts. However, D.T. Suzuki came from a very practice oriented, very rigorous background. And incidentally, D.T. Suzuki was the founder of the Zen Study Society, which was later taken over by Edo Roshi. So on Shaku, returned to the United States in 1905 and traveled around the country giving lectures on Zen Buddhism. And during that time, D.T. Suzuki served as his translator. He was joined on that trip by a young monk who had studied under him named Nyogen Senzaki. Nyogen Senzaki, of course, went on to found his own Zendo after Soenchaku requested him to stay on in the United States with the admonition that he should not attempt to teach or even speak a single word about Zen for 17 years until he had fully come to understand and become familiar with the culture of the United States and had attained sufficient proficiency in English to teach without the embarrassment of trying to speak a language totally foreign to him. And of course, Nyogen Senzaki eventually developed a strong friendship with another Soen, Soen Roshi, a different character than Soen 
Shaku. But same sounding name. And through that friendship between Yogan Senzaki and Soen Shaku, Soen Roshi developed the idea of sending one of his students to the United States to teach Zen Buddhism. And that is how Edo Roshi ended up coming first to Hawaii and then to New York, where he revived the, at that time, dormant Zen study society and built it into a flourishing organization with a temple in New York City and a monastery in the Catskill Mountains. And so that is the story of Soen Shaku. And of course, there's so much that I can't tell you about his life, his teachings, his understanding. But this gives you some idea of the connection that he has to our practice, to our uh, organization and mothership. And now a, a very different sort of story, but one which shares some elements and one which I hope will illustrate the importance of the role of the teacher and the student, what the student owes to the teacher and what the teacher owes to the student. And also touches on the topic that I would really like to address, which is right meditation. This is the story of Angulimala. Angulimala. The name means finger garland or finger necklace. Angulimala was not the name given to this individual at birth. He was born of a noble family, a, a Brahmin family. His father was a very high up, well-respected man in the noble court. But Angulimala was born under a bad sign, literally. When his father asked an astrologer to run his horoscope, he found that his son had been born under the robber constellation. I don't know what constellation that is, and I'm not a big fan of astrology, but that is uh, not a good thing, apparently. And his father was taken aback and decided to raise him in the right way, hoping that through proper education and love and care, that perhaps he could avoid his evil fate. And so he was given the name Ahimsaka, Ahimsaka, which means harmless. in the hopes that the name itself might exert a propitious influence. And Ahimsaka was a wonderful child by all accounts. He was a star student, brilliant, gifted, a great athlete known for his strength, an all around stud in every way. He was sent by his father to what is 
the equivalent of a university, one of the earliest in India at the time, where he was again a star student and the favorite of his master. So much so that the other students became jealous and tried to turn the master against him. One after another, he came, they came to the master and told tales of Ahimsaka and how he was plotting to take over the master's position, how he wanted only to depose the master and take on his role. And although in the beginning, the master sent them away saying, nonsense, nonsense, this man is of noble birth, a good, kind, true, brilliant man. But eventually the students turned the master's mind against Ahimsaka. And as Ahimsaka was completing his time of learning, in a moment when traditionally the student would give to the master a gift, a kind of tuition for having been taught and brought up in the proper fashion. The master gave Ahimsaka a task to perform as his graduation gift and a request for a particular kind of gift. And the gift that he asked for was 1,000 pinky fingers from the right hand of a human being. And here we have one very important lesson, which is the role of the student and the role of the teacher and how important it is for the student to find the right teacher and the teacher to find the right student. And in this case, there was a mismatch. Also illustrates what the student owes to the teacher and what the teacher owes to the student. And just as Soen Shaku and Yogan Senzaki had an unbreakable bond and Yogan Senzaki did not hesitate to do as his teacher instructed and go to this foreign land to work, to live for 17 years without even being able to say a word about Zen. Ahimsaka received the admonition of his teacher and did what he was told. his teacher having violated the principles of what is owed to the student. But Ahimsaka was also not blameless in this regard. When the teacher requests something immoral, something that goes against the precepts, the student must reject the teacher, despite whatever kind of bond they have. But Ahimsaka embraced his teacher and set out on the life of a criminal, 
a serial killer. Knowing that no one was going to willingly give up their pinky finger just because he asked them nicely, he decided that he would kill 1,000 people, harvest their fingers, and thus fulfill his debt to his master. And so he set about one after another, killing and robbing person after person after person. And as his fame spread, he got a new name, Angulimala, because in order to keep the pinky fingers safe to keep them from being devoured by ravens or carrion crows. He hung the fingers around his neck in a garland and thus got the name Angulimala. And when he had harvested 999 fingers, his mother at last got wind of a bandit who was killing people and robbing them. And somehow with a mother's intuition, she knew that this was her son who had been born under a bad sign and had come under malign influences. And she resolved to travel to him, to convince him to give up this life of a criminal. And when Angulimala saw his mother approach, he was, of course, of two minds. By this time, he had fallen into such depravity that he no longer thought about killing, no longer considered it a crime or a sin. And yet something stirred in him when he saw his mother and there was some part of him that said, no, 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 you can't do this. That's the worst possible crime, matricide. But the other part of him said, no, 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 I must complete my task. Meanwhile, Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, using his supernatural powers, had become aware of Angulimala, had become aware of the condition of his soul, had become aware that he was about to commit matricide for which the karmic punishment was a direct descent into hell. And Buddha was moved by compassion to cut off Angulimala's karmic trajectory. And so he traveled to where Angulimala was, walking 30 miles. And just in the nick of time, as Angulimala was about to swoop down on his mother, Buddha appeared. as a wandering monk. And Angulimala breathed a sigh of relief and said, ah, I don't have to kill my mother. I can take this monk's finger. And so he ran 
away from his mother and towards the Buddha, running as fast as he could. And yet somehow, no matter how fast he ran, he could never approach the Buddha. He would run in one direction, running to his left, and the Buddha would appear on his right. And he would run on his, to his right, and then the Buddha would appear on his left. And no matter how he ran, in what direction, or what speed, the Buddha never got any closer. And so finally, he shouted at Shakyamuni, stop, stop. How am I going to get your finger if you go on like that? Stop. And the Buddha looked at Angulimali, looked deep into his eyes with true compassion and infinite patience and said to Angulimali, Angulimali, I have stopped. It's you who have not stopped. And at that moment, something in Anguli Mali's heart broke. Something turned in him. He pushed his karmic trajectory away. He fell at the Buddha's feet and worshiped him and declared his intention of becoming a disciple. And thus he found his true teacher. And there's a lot more of Angulimala's life that can be told how he became one of Buddha's greatest monks and became a great saint, having completely converted from his ignorant, depraved condition to a condition of peace and love and compassion. But what really attracts me most of all in this story and what I keep coming back to again and again and again are the words that the Buddha used to convert Angulimala. I have stopped Angulimala. It's you who have not stopped. And this, I think, is really the crux of right meditation. I have stopped. You have not stopped. In right meditation, we stop. We neither run towards our goal, nor run away from our fear. We don't run this way or that way, being deceived by delusion. We don't run from, we don't run towards. 
we stop. We notice exactly where we are. We settle exactly where we are. Joy arises and we don't grab onto it. Fear arises and we don't move away from it. Pain arises and we sit with it. Daydreams come and daydreams go, but we sit like a mountain and let those clouds just drift on by. Our breath steady, centered. And this I think is right meditation. And I could speak more about right meditation and perhaps the next time I give a Dharma talk, I will. But I'd like to leave you with just this. I have stopped Angulimala. It's you who have not stopped. And so in your meditation, please stop. 